25 years ago, I received uh, an invitation from MIT professor James Fujimoto, who asked me if I was interested in collaborating with his research group, which included an MD PhD student, David Wong. This was part of a larger collaboration in ophthalmology with Dr. Carmen Pulifito and Dr. Joel Schumann, who were then at Harvard Medical School. I almost said no. This new area of biomedical optics seemed to have nothing to do with my job working on intersatellite laser communication systems. But after thinking about it for a few days, I decided I would see what I could learn and contribute and began working on off hours on what would become the field of OCT. The result of that decision was I got to collaborate and contribute and observe the progression of this industry over the past 25 years to where it is today, adding more than a billion dollars a year to the economy, advancing scientific and clinical understanding, and impacting the lives of millions of people. OCT has allowed doctors to peer into living tissue in a way they couldn't do before. It's helped fight blinding disease and deadly cardiovascular disease and cancer. It saved enormous sums in, in healthcare expenditures and provided thousands of high quality jobs. And the best of this technology is still to come. This is a story about how ideas can grow and the value of collaboration and the power to innovate through multidisciplinary teams and the essential role of government research, or government funding for research, the role of entrepreneurism and industry and how all these things came together to transform a, a healthcare idea into healthcare impact. I felt like I was taking a real risk 25 years ago entering this field that I knew nothing about. But I crossed that boundary and I have to say that that my career in biomedical optics almost ended as soon as it started. And I learned there's a big difference between taking risks and taking foolish risks. I was working at Lincoln Lab, which is a, a government research facility that does top secret and classified work for the Department of Defense. And before long, we had a, a system built up like the one shown here, and we were trying to increase its speed and understand its capabilities. And we could measure things like this laser diode collimating lens but we wanted to measure a living lens, a live rabbit eye. And there was a conference uh, deadline rapidly approaching. And we had two choices. Pick up that equipment, get permission to ship it 20 miles away to MIT campus, or try and bring a rabbit into a secure DOD research facility where rabbits didn't belong. And my estimate was I could get neither one done in time due to bureaucracy. So I decided to try and smuggle the rabbit in. We had the experiment planned wait, late on a Sunday night, and, and I got a call. Is, is this Mr. Swanson? Yes, I said. Come down to the guard's desk right away. I thought, oh boy. I opened the door, and I was running down the hall, and I turned the corner, and I could see David and his guest, and, and I started to walk casually like nothing was unusual. And I opened the door, and, and I looked around, and there was no sign of a rabbit. And the guard tapped his finger on the desk and he was motioning for me to sign David and his guest in saying no classified information would be uh, accessed. So I signed them in and, and he indicated us. So we started to walk in. He said, hold on, what's in that black case? And, and David's guest was carrying a big black case that said Sony VHS camcorder on the side. Back then video recorders were very large and, and you know, what's the one thing you're not supposed to bring into a government research facility? It's, it's recording equipment. And he says, put it up here on the desk. And, and so it's put up on the desk. And he goes, open it. And I thought, here it goes. So he, he opened the case. And there was this rabbit twitching. And the guard jumped back. And he looked at the rabbit. And he looked at us. And he looked back at the rabbit. And he goes, oh, it's just a rabbit. Go on in. So it was a close call. But we got this wonderful result of a live rabbit uh, measurement. There were a lot of precursors to OCT. Uh, back in the early 90s. There was wonderful pioneering work out of Vienna and out of Japan and Switzerland and United States. The first paper on OCT was published in the journal Science in 91 and this slide is courtesy of David Wong who was the first author on that paper and of course a pioneer in the field and he came up with the idea of stacking these one-dimensional scans to produce these two-dimensional images. And it's interesting that this paper not only described the basic concept but it illustrated this application in ophthalmology and cardiology, which today are the two biggest and most important clinical applications. The paper's been cited 10,000 times and, and illustrates the power to innovate 
through close teams of doctors and, and scientists and engineers working together. The way OCT works is you shine light into, into a tissue and you get reflections and basically OCT measures those reflections. And, and the reflections have different amplitudes and they come from different depths as the light is scattered and absorbed and interacts with the morphology. But because the speed of light is so fast and these dimensions are so small, you can't use electronic techniques like are used in ultrasound and radar. You have to use interferometric techniques, which is combining two light beams, one from a reference path and one from the tissue. And they're combined in a way that you never really have to directly measure those incredibly short propagation times of light. And it's a lot of wonderful properties that allow you to produce one, two, and three dimensional images. One of the reasons OCT has been so impactful is the underlying physics of that, of that interferometric process. Some OCT systems are so sensitive, they're limited only by the quantum nature of light. They can achieve sometimes a sensitivity of one part in 10 to the 12, measuring one one thousandth times one one billionth of the transmitted light. There's no chance that OCT would be where it is today without government funding. And, and over the past decade, governments from, from all around the world have invested well in excess of $500 million. That's a lot of taxpayer dollars. And, and today, more than ever, there's a lot of pressure on those government budgets and, and even calls for capping or reducing research. And of course, it's important we ensure that taxpayer money is invested wisely. Government funding allowed researchers to pursue creative ideas, and the competitive and collaborative process of scientific research rapidly moved the field of OCT forward. Here you can see that first paper in 1991 that was a collaboration between MIT and Harvard. And seven years later, this had grown to 123 publications, and you can see how information is disseminated and independent groups begin their own research and, and sharing their results. And at this point, there was a global network of researchers. And if you overlay this on a map, you can see that collaborations went beyond institutions, went beyond countries, and across oceans. And if you fast forward today, you can see there's 21,000 scientific publications, and there's worldwide participation and collaboration of innovative scientists and engineers and clinicians from over 500 organizations. You can see that good science moves fast, is highly collaborative, and is global in reach. There's one collaboration that won't even fit on this world map, and that's because it's crossed the boundary into outer space, where astronauts use OCT aboard the International Space Station to evaluate degradations in, in vision due to prolonged weightlessness. A tremendous amount of innovation comes at the boundaries of fields and disciplines, taking uh, ideas and knowledge and technology from, from one field and applying it to another. I think it's the richest source of innovation. And the clearest example of this in OCT is the adaptation and leveraging of technology from the fiber communication industry. All the lasers and, and the fibers and the system concepts and the photo detectors all came from telecom. And without the billions of dollars spent in telecom and, and related fields, OCT wouldn't be where it is today. Today, OCT systems are a thousand times faster than they used to be, which challenges electronic designers to use the latest technology. The images are some of the biggest in medicine, which challenges software engineers to collect and render and display that information to the doctor. And they use the latest in computer gaming and computer vision. OCT has tiny optical probes that have to fit inside torturous channels, which, which challenges mechanical designers. It's a rich combination of electronic design, hardware design, software design, clinical devices, and clinical medicine. It's what makes OCT so much fun to work on. And it's one of the reasons this multidisciplinary nature and crossing of boundaries is to why there's been so much innovation and why there's so much innovation yet to come. While it was impossible to pick 25 years ago that OCT would be where it is today, there was an unmet need in ophthalmology. Back then, ophthalmologists, of course, had a wonderful view of the surface of the retina, as shown in this fundus photo, but they couldn't see into the retina like that histological section. And seeing into the retina turned out to be very important. On the right, you can see a patient with normal and abnormal vision. There's a dramatic difference in the vision of these two patients, yet the fundus photo appears only a little bit different. 
OCT allowed doctors to peer into that retina, and you see an obvious and dramatic difference between these two retinal structures. OCT allowed doctors to detect disease at an early state before irreversible vision loss occurred. It helped in understanding the biology of ophthalmic diseases. It helped in bringing in new pharmaceutical therapies. And on the left, you can see the histology and the OCT image, and it illustrates the power of OCT to provide a non-invasive biopsy. Here's a picture of a prototype that was used at MIT in, in MIT's early human studies. And I remember walking in uh, after IRB approval finally came, walking into a room with, with Jim Fujimoto and jo Joe Isaac and Michael He. Joe Isaac and Michael He were key contributors to the MIT effort, and Joe, of course, is a pioneer in the field. And Michael, who was a student at the time, working with Carmen and Joel, helped come up with many of the protocols, and he implemented them in software that powered the first 10 years of commercial systems. It's a clear testament to the positive impact a student can have on, on society. As we were walking into the room, I, I remember thinking, okay, who is going to go first? And is this really safe? After all, we were going to shine an eye, a laser in someone's eye and focus it right on the retina. And, and all over the walls there are warning signs about lasers and, and the importance of eye safety. And before I could finish that thought, Professor Fujimoto sat down, took off his glasses, put his head on a chin rest and said, let's go. And I thought, wow, that was courageous. And, and it was safe and it is safe and out came this wonderful image on the computer screen and we took turns measuring our retinas and, and not long after that a system like this was shipped in the New England Eye Center. And here you can see a video a few days, uh, uh, maybe a year or so later, this, this slit lamp was modified by Jay Way who was then at, at, uh, at Humphrey Instruments which became Zy uh, part of Zeiss. And, and you can see if this will play. Uh, you see the electro-optic box, you can see the software was implemented on a Macintosh back then. You can see the laser beam scanning through the optic disc, there's a little aiming beam there. And out, out comes this wonderful two-dimensional image. One of the early patients that walked into the clinic at the New England Eye Center was a, a woman in her mid-70s. And she came in and sat down and the procedure was explained to her. And uh, there was an aiming beam. I don't know if you saw it in that video, but the purpose of the aiming beam was to allow the patient to fixate, otherwise they'd follow the scanning beam, which was slow back then, and that would mess up the image. So they said, you know, please focus on the aiming beam. And she said, I'm blind in this eye. And, and I thought someone hit me with a brick. And, and uh, you know, I realized that these aren't healthy students. These are, these are real patients with, with serious ophthalmic diseases, and it was a sobering feeling of empathy. And the second thing that hit me was this system was no longer in a, user, a, a remote university research lab. This had crossed the boundary into clinical care. And, and uh, as they say in the Army, it's time for ground truth. And there was a lot of ground truth. And it's kind of ironic that four MIT engineers uh, designed this idea of an aiming beam for ophthalmology and forgot that some of the patients wouldn't be able to see it. But the tight knit. Uh, group working together quickly overcame these ground truth and, and other issues and I guess the message is the close collaboration between doctors and scientists and engineers and and even the patients is what speeds innovation and despite the relative simplicity of that technology by today's standard it was used in in, in pioneering studies in glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration and other diseases that eventually grew to a patient database of over 5,000 people and one of the milestones of that work is shown here. It was the first clinical atlas of OCT. And it was published by Carmen Pulifito and Michael He and Joel Schumann and Jim Fujimoto. It was published in 1996 and provided a guide for other doctors interested in this new imaging modality. There were lots of other important milestones. That same year, Zeiss released their, their first OCT product. And that was so-called time domain OCT. And, and, and that pu uh, pioneered the, or, or supported the field for the next 10 years until 2006, at which time it had become a standard of care in ophthalmology. There were over 30 million uh, time domain images. Important pharmaceuticals had been developed and uh, over 6,000 instruments had been sold. And then came Fourier domain OCT. And back in 2003, three research groups around the world published seminal papers in Fourier Domain OCT. One was in Vienna, one was at Massachusetts General Hospital, and one was at Duke University. And Fourier Domain ushered in tremendous advances. 
Instead of driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, you were driving down the highway at 6,000 miles an hour. And lots of companies entered the marketplace, and, and the first company to introduce that technology was OptiView in 2006. And here you can see you know, how much the technology has improved. Impressive ergonomic design, the system scans at incredibly high speed over a large area of the retina. There's sophisticated software and image processing and motion stabilization. And, and out pops these wonderful images in just a few seconds that allow doctors to make everyday decisions. The technology has improved incredibly over the past 25 years, but the essential concept is still the same. No technology moves forward without industry doing a lot of heavy lifting. It takes tremendous effort in terms of money, time, and resources to take a university prototype and make a robust clinical product. And there's a lot of silent innovation that happens in industry. In some ways, industry is an unsung hero in, in the collective world of making clinical impact. Here you can see all the system companies that entered the OCT space over the past 25 years. And what's interesting is 40% of them are associated with government research. To me, that says that government taxpayer dollars are having a positive translational impact on society. The second thing to note are all the blue dots. 75% of these companies are or originated as startups. It's a clear testament to the entrepreneurial spirit and the power that entrepreneurism can have on translating technology. And the odds are against them. You know, this common statistic is nine out of 10 startups fail. But it's the excitement of the dream combined with an important mission that moves innovative businesses forward. I was very fortunate to be a co-founder of, of the first company in 1992. It was acquired by Zeiss two years later in, in an embryonic form, and Zeiss did all the heavy lifting to bring that product to market. The second company was in 1998, was in cardiology, and was acquired 10 years later by St. Jude Medical. And the risk those businesses took resulted in bringing innovative products, if not revolutionary products, to market nearly a decade faster than they might have come otherwise, thus benefiting people with blindness and cardiovascular disease. There's one more component of the story remaining, and that's impact. No researcher will work in a field. No government will invest taxpayer dollars in a field. And, and, and entrepreneurs and, and, and business won't develop products unless there's an important mission and unless there's impact. And OCT unequivocally has an important mission and has had tremendous economic, scientific, and clinical impact. No technology moves forward without the economics making sense for the investor, for the, for the system manufacturer, for the doctor, for the hospital, for the healthcare insurer, even for the government and the taxpayer. All those components of the value chain need to see a positive return or technology will not thrive and impact patient care. And there's lots of ways to quantify the economic impact. Here's one of them. All those companies I showed you earlier are producing high quality jobs in engineering and manufacturing and customer service and sales and marketing. And at the hospitals and clinics around the world, there are doctors and nurses and medical technicians that run and operate the roughly 50,000 installed systems. Cumulatively, that counts for 20,000 person years of direct jobs and perhaps 100,000 person years of indirect jobs. Here's all the NIH and NSF funding over the past 20 years. It totals $560 million. And a lot of this is not for developing OCT. They're simply using OCT in their, in their research. But using that upper bound, if you compare this with the system revenue, you see it's 10 times that. It's approaching a billion dollars a year or $5.2 billion cumulatively. And if you assume standard corporate tax rates and individual tax rates associated with these companies, that's $540 million back to the taxpayer and back to the government. And even more impressive from a healthcare savings point of view, you saw this slide earlier, $560 million over 20 years of NIH spending. $3 billion of savings over two years. The guidance of antivascular endothelial growth factor therapy used in age-related macular degeneration alone saves billions of dollars a year by avoiding unnecessary injections. In addition to the economic impact, there's a scientific impact as exemplified by the growing number of peer-reviewed journal articles. And it's interesting that OCT has passed the boundary of ophthalmology. Ophthalmology has helped make possible advances in cardiology, in dermatology, in gastroenterology. 
And of course, the most important impact is the clinical impact. And uh, OCT is one of the fastest adopted technologies in ophthalmology. There are roughly 30 million OCT scans performed every year, which is roughly one every few seconds. And while this is impressive for a technology that's still fairly young, we shouldn't forget that this is more than numbers and statistics. This is helping people. Millions of people facing blinding ophthalmic disease and want to see their grandchildren or cook a meal or do all the things we take for granted. And there are exciting advances still coming in OCT is OCT angiography, which promises to reveal with exquisite detail the microvessels and the blood flow that feeds the retina. There are advances in new kinds of high performance laser sources that can scan at incredibly high speeds and do full eye length scanning. There's things like polarization sensitive OCT that can measure birefringence and hopes to offer improved contrast of the retina. The eye is a window into the brain, and here are two textbooks that have just been published on OCT's growing important role in understanding and treating major neurological diseases. OCT is being used to guide surgical procedures. A surgeon can look through a microscope and see the normal microscope image, but also can see the OCT image. And on the left, it looks like the surgeon's operating in thin air. And on the right, you can see that OCT reveals this vitreous membrane pulling on the retina. And in this short video, you can see the surgeon delicately uses that tool to remove that traction and restore the retina to its normal condition. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the world. OCT is being used to understand heart disease and to come up with new therapies. And it, there's over 100,000 intravascular procedures performed every year. And the way it works is the coronary artery that feeds the heart sometimes has plaque. And the little OCT catheter goes over that looks like these aren't going to play, and, and basically pulls back and shines light and can produce a, uh, an image of a human coronary artery. And then the doctor can look at this offline and, and uh, do a fly through, for example, of this, this uh, coronary artery. And you can see that this stent has successfully opened this plaque to allow blood flow to restore the, the, uh, the blood to nourish the heart and hopefully prevent a heart attack. OCT is playing an important role in cancer, and I want to emphasize that the results are preliminary here, but there's lots of exciting, uh, promising results. And one is in GI disease, and you can see how an endoscope introduces an OCT catheter into the esophagus, a balloon inflates, and centers the, the OCT catheter, and it spins around. Not only can it see disease on the surface, it can potentially see disease buried into the esophageal wall. And this system can stop and mark a suspicious area to allow the endoscopist to come back and later biopsy or perform a resection. And esophageal cancer is the fastest growing cancer in the United States and is a deadly cancer. Millions of people suffer from acid reflux and Barrett's esophagus and, and they're at an elevated risk for this esophageal cancer. And one way to beat cancer is early detection. And here's some wonderful work out of MGH that uses a, an OCT-powered tethered capsule. The idea is there's an inexpensive capsule that can be swallowed and in an outpatient set it with minimum sedation and cost. And the idea is this low-cost screening can allow a doctor to tell disease from normal tissue in a very early state. Women, 10% uh, of women will experience breast cancer in their life, um, and roughly 100,000 of those people have to undergo a second surgery, of these women have to undergo a second surgery when they find a positive cancer margin from the first surgery. This causes tremendous hardship and adds more than a billion dollars of expenditures to the health care. And here's some uh, commercial systems that are in cl clinical trials now that allows the hope is that OCTP can, can be used in the operating theater to detect margins and uh, reduce or eliminate those uh, reoccurrences. Because OCT is so tiny, it can fit in a needle. And that needle, you can make a microscope within that needle. And you can use that needle to introduce OCT into hard to reach places like the lungs or the liver or the prostate. OCT is allowing development and biologists to peer into the development of the heart at the earliest stages. Here's a normal and diseased mouse heart that's just a few days old. You can understand how the heart develops from the earliest stages. You can understand the effects of genetics and the impact of things like fetal alcohol have on a developing embryo. There are many other exciting applications of OCT and so many, uh, uh, we can't go through them all, than dermatology and pulmonology and many non-medical applications in biometric security, measuring 
art, precious art, veterinary medicine, and I'm sure OCT is going to impact many of these areas. This is the ecosystem that powered OCT to where it is today, and this is the ecosystem that will power it into the future. And when you think about the future, of course, no one can predict it, but the past is a good indicator. And as I look back at the past 25 years, I see incredible innovation. I see progress in the technology and the applications and the impact OCT has had on millions of people in terms of improved quality of life. And collectively, that's a tremendous accomplishment from people all over the world. And as I look forward, I see amazing frontiers to explore in both the applications and the technology. I see things like this tiny photonic integrated circuit. This OCT receiver can do things that existing receivers can't do today. It, it's low loss and broad bandwidth and high speed, and, and, it, and it's one-tenth the size and one-tenth the cost. Technology like this will, and other technologies like it, will power OCT into the, into the future. It will help ophthalmologists help their patients, and it will help all the other clinical disciplines as well. It will open up new kinds of applications in, in, in screening and in lightweight, flexible handheld devices and robotic surgery and multimodality. And very importantly, reducing costs will allow OCT to serve people all over the world in less developed economies. OCT is, is not at a plateau. There are lots of boundaries still to cross. The opportunity for future impact of biomedical optics in general and OCT in specific is incredibly promising. I'm very happy 25 years ago that I accepted that invitation and, and proud to be a member of the OCT community. Thank you for listening.